Hello, good evening, everybody. Hi. Welcome to the second uh, day of our conference. How do we look back and ahead? 2020 has been a very, very challenging year. And unfortunately, it also looks like 2021 is not easier either for all of us, whether we are sitting here in India, different parts of the states, whether we are in Pune, Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, Kolkata, um, anywhere, as well as other parts of the country, other parts of the world, uh, whoever we've been talking to, we all know that the situation is pretty much similar and we're all sailing through the same boat more or less. And especially on the artists, it has been a very, very difficult year, a year of reflections, a year of just having too many doubts and questions and not really knowing what to do about it. But at the same time, we are looking at hope, we are looking at healing, we are looking at holding each other together. And as an, as an attempt, as a really very, very desperate and a genuine attempt, we decided to reach out to our friends, our colleagues, our seniors, um, teachers, mentors, dance practitioners from India as well as abroad. And we thought maybe let's talk to each other and let's see how we can help each other through this whole situation. My name is Aditi. I am um, a contemporary dance theater artist. I also work as the artistic director of International Association for Performing Arts and Research. Uh, and it is my honor to present to you four extremely esteemed, wonderful artists within India, as well as globally, people who are making a change, driving passion and creating work and questioning the regular, questioning the normal. With me today are these beautiful, beautiful people. Uh, Martin has joined us from Argentina. Urmimala Ma'am is joining us from Delhi. Olga has joined us all the way from Russia and Sanjukta is in our neighbor city, Mumbai right now. Uh, and with me is Tanvi, my fellow partner in crime and a creative associate of IPAR. And I'm going to hand it over to Tanvi. And I think Tanvi, um, I'm going to request you to take it over from here and uh, lead this conversation for now. Thank you, Aditi. Um, I extend a warm, warm welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for making the time to do this and to share your experiences with us. I am sure that we're all going to have something wonderful to take away from today's discussion. So without further ado, let us begin. Um, our first guest for today is Sanjukta Vag. Hi, Sanjukta. Um, a little bit about her. Sanjukta is the co-founder of an interdisciplinary initiative called Beej in Mumbai, which is engaged in exploring the creative process and improvisa improvisation alternative methods of classical dance pedagogy and collaborative performance since the year 2005. She's a performer, choreographer, educator, and curator, and has trained extensively under Rajashri Shirke in Kathak and Pandit Murli Manohar Shukla in Hindustani music. Her engagement with theater honed by playwright director Chetan Datar and Navarasa Sadhana training with Ji Venu. Her year-long experience at the Trinity Laban School of Dance in London and her love of literature and deep unease with the comfort zones have led her to the interdisciplinary and exploratory mode of work. Uh, Sanjukta, has been, uh, Sanjukta has several awards and scholarships in her kitty and uh, her critically acclaimed performances have traveled to several festivals across the globe. Welcome Sanjukta, how, how are you? Hi. Hi Tanvi. And hi, hello, friends. It's lovely to be here. But uh, I think this time is especially a time when we're all at a loss for words. Right. Because uh, it's almost like the reality outside is just so daunting that Absolutely. one is in a state of pause. And I think that's what this last year has been for me. Um, right, right. Could you could you tell us a little bit, yes, about that, please? And um, also, like like you said, since we have been in this state of um, 
uh, a suspended pause, you know, which seems like it is going on forever and ever. Um, could you also tell us a little bit about uh, how your relationship with space has has changed in the past year and uh, your uh, relationship also with your body with respect to the space? So, yes, over to you. Absolutely. Um, I know the title of today's talk is Looking Back, Looking Forward. But uh, somehow this whole year, like I said, has been uh, just a um, point in my life where I've completely slowed down and I'm looking at the past and I haven't really finished looking back yet because it's been an excavation of how we have been operating as a culture how we have been operating as performing artists and how we've been operating as human beings. And um, what I have seen is I found even the pre-COVID times uh, quite flawed <laughs> in the sense of how we've operated and how the cultures of performance have been. And I especially think that has been a slight term uh, emphasis on doing like this this whole emphasis on doing this and doing that or riyaz karo and do your practice and perform and go from show to show and the show must go on and this kind of a, a almost like a bubble that we had built around ourselves that you know uh, this is the world it's the glorious world of the arts and we take forward and all that suddenly shattered and here we found ourselves um, in the back seat suddenly and alone to look at what the essence of this, this art that we have been practicing is. And I think a few things that I um, have found is that um, this time for me has been in some senses about not doing and about being and allowing something to reveal itself. Because I think as practitioners of dance and as practitioners of a sensory form which deals with skin, which deals with breath, which deals with space, uh, somewhere what brings me to work every day is trying to access this energy, uh, this almost this life energy that's present in each of us, not just as dancers, but as human beings. And I think uh, I heard this beautiful talk by uh, Lata Mani, who speaks of Tantra. And she says, we're constantly saying, I am, and this is Sanjukta Wak, the choreographer, and this is my company, and this is what we've been doing. But she spoke of this concept of inter, like how interrelated are we? And I think COVID somewhere gave us this one tight slap and just made us locked in our own houses. But really, we understand how someone in Russia and someone in uh, the United States and someone in Japan is suddenly connected to me and how this insect which is walking on my windowsill and this tree outside my house, how we connect, how we talk. So this idea of us being interrelated beings uh, has really uh, been something that I'm uh, inspired by. And I've connected to like-minded people across the globe thanks to thanks to the internet and thanks to zoom and there have been so many movements that have been uh, about inclusivity about care about accessing these energy points uh, which um, i've connected to and i'd like to name some i have really connected with uh, navte johar and his idea of uh, yoga um, in which he connects with with breath and talks about 
breath leading us you know, because as dancers we think or even as actors it's about action and it's about doing but can we just allow ourselves to be in our environment and see what comes so i i would say that this year i has been one of glorious falls in some ways because i realized how i have been hopping literally manically from project to project before this and not letting things grow and not letting things stay so in the kathak term terminology i would say i have really gone vilambit and i've tried to understand values that i stand for values of uh, democracy what spaces would we like to create for our future generations and that certainly not the spaces that we inhabited and that's why beach the initiative i have been have uh, also uh, been a part of this movement called unmute which is about um, uh, you know uh, a take after the me too uh, movement that happened worldwide and we've been asking how we can make our spaces more democratic less exploitative exploitative where everyone finds their voice and their own ways of, uh, of expression you know so i really think that diversifying and and that's why i'm really excited about this conversation today as well because i think through these conversations with like minded people i think we can really build a powerful ecosystem and i see ipar doing that really well actually because uh, you know one more thing one more uh, uh, thing i wanted to say was about history like this 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 um time has also been one of looking at my history looking at my city as performing artists we don't even know how the ecosystems of performing arts in our own cities operates we don't know which which artists are present even in our communities and in bombay especially we we already live in such bubbles that there are, there are no spaces where we can meet so actively trying to forge these spaces form these spaces to have conversations uh, about forming inclusive egalitarian spaces where people can grow and then just offering our methods and there are hundreds across the world of tapping energy and getting in touch with your sensory self i think the world needs that today all of us are wearing masks all of us are shying away from touch like we already were shying away from touch even in the pre covid world but with covid it's become kind of manic so one thing that i've been doing with my students is exploring erotic poetry you know we are really looking at touch smell taste because this is something that can keep us going and uh, i have explored pedagogy and how i teach and i have made my classroom a space that i would want to go to and i don't want to create perfect dancers i want to make my students leave the space with a smile on their face you know and wanting to come back again that's been uh, you know my time so my audience this year has been my students and they have been fantastic in fact we did one whole series recently on the history of kathak and we called it postcards to a dancer where we took various dancers in in kathak history and the whole class had to write a postcard to them uh, like they they living today and then one of the students used to role play and answer these questions so we we really looked at innovative ways of exploring the history of our home and it's been revelatory for me i've been dancing kathak right. for the past 30 years there are really beautiful you know excavations from the past of how people have been radical and also how you can form your own kind of tree of predecessors with many different artists from across the world right like it's not limited my tradition is definitely not limited by geography like uh, if it wasn't for a, the african american and 
poet and Juza ke shanghi, I wouldn't be dancing Kathak. Like when I danced her choreo poem to a sarangi and imagined her character in Banaras, that really opened my doors to Kathak and my own culture and my own predecessor of the Tawaif, the courtesan, in many, many different ways. So I, I really think that we need to dive, dive, use this time to diversify the conversation with ourselves. But more than anything, I would like to say is we need to hold space for the real performers. Who are the doctors, who are the frontline workers, we just need to hold space for them and, and even the patients and see how we can uh, help ease them. And these can be in your circle of five friends or 50 people you know or whoever, how you can use your art to make their day easier would be something that uh, I really take away from this. Absolutely. Over time. No, 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 don't worry about it. No, no, thank you for touching upon such um, uh, poignant uh, thoughts. And I think you've brought out some very interesting points here on uh, collaboration and history and uh, working, you know, uh, with our senses. So getting grounded in them again. Um, and I especially love the idea of, you know, our breath and bodies leading us since those are the only things we seem to be left with at this point. So um, thank you so much, Sanjukta. I will come back to that at the end of the session when we come back for a dialogue. And I will now move on to our second guest for today, Olga. Um, Olga Kostarina has joined us from Russia today. Um, with almost 20 years of professional stage experience, she has worked as an artist in classical ballet and contemporary dance companies, different show projects and dramatic theater groups. Now do, she is now doing her own solo productions in uh, the genre of physical theater and dance uh, based on the principles of human philosophy and individual psychology. Uh, these shows have been successfully performed all around the world and she has also uh, developed a workshop system called Speaking Body for Physical Performers. Um, these, uh, uh, this program is dedicated to the development of movement, freedom, and expression on stage. Olga is a choreographer, and she has been a choreographer for several big projects for theater, dance, and show in Moscow. Hi, Olga. Hello. Hello, everybody. Yes. Thank How you. are you doing today? Yeah, thanks for this meeting. Uh, it is really very important for all of us to talk, to, to hear others, to think, uh, to share our experience. Absolutely. And as you said in bio, I am a choreographer and dancer and I work, um, I used to travel and work, work worldwide or all around the globe. Um, I'm an independent artist. Uh, I mean, I don't work for any theater on permanent contract and all my professional activity, I organize myself. Uh, last 10 years, it was like that. And uh, okay. it was always abroad somewhere in different countries. Um, as an example, my own performances, I didn't play any of them in my motherland in Moscow, in Russia, I, it was always abroad somewhere in another country. And uh, as you can guess, <laughs> everything was stopped uh, last uh, March, March right. last year. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, and not only my own performances and workshops uh, were cancelled, also the big projects, the projects here in Moscow, where I supposed to work as a choreographer. They were cancelled or frozen for an indeterminate period of time. So this is the impact of this pandemic. Right. Uh, and, but I just before the quarantine of this total lockdown, I have visited a big international arts festival in Emirates, uh, where theatre people all around the globe come to and many of us, so we know each other for several years, so meeting in different parts of the world for festivals, conferences, uh, and other uh, arts industry events. 
So it was a very friendly and uh, also very productive meeting, a very productive time, many plans and projects uh, were discussed and start, started there, but uh, everybody was looking forward and uh, excited uh, and was in a great mood. And uh, then all the plans ruined, everything was canceled, uh, but the time that we spent together um, helped a lot. Uh, this at least first two, three months of the pandemic times, so, because uh, it was like a reserve of a good mood. That's why it's so important to be together, to connect, to be connected. Uh, for now, at least through Zoom conference also, because all, as I said, that meeting that helped so much, it was uh, like a sun which is still shining in these dark times. Uh, nobody knew for how long it will last and everybody was still talking about the future projects and planning and discussing. And we were happy that uh, not for too long it will last, but uh, this time when I realized that uh, the situation is not going to become better, but the situation we feel is just going to become harder. I focused on teaching. First, the uh, sure it was online classes, so then we had not done for the school in Russia. Okay. And then, uh, when it was permitted, I continued the uh, personal training. So, and uh, I worked with the dancers and sportsmen and mostly with uh, young people, with children, and uh, also help to keep a good mood, to create a positive, positive mood, because uh, children and youth, they always look forward. Uh, so it was two way road. I share my professional experience. I inspire the students uh, for the new achievements, and uh, they give me positive mood. It was very because this post to me I also shared again with others and uh, it was a good mood, especially when they learn something new. It was a fantastic feeling. I think every teacher and every whatever they can understand me. And also for me it was a time to develop the projects and which were pushed back because of time lag which I usually had before. Uh, I could think uh, on old ideas, uh, work on the scenarios uh, which were collecting dust in my cabinet uh, for years, and create material for new purposes for the future. In that way, I think that for choreographers and for directors, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I, there seems to be a hiss uh, when you're speaking. Uh, so could you like maybe speak a little louder? Because I think there's something in the background, uh, which is why your voice is not very clear. Okay. Okay. Or maybe uh, even uh, if you have your phones handy, maybe wearing them also could probably help. Yeah, but I don't screw laptop. Okay. <laughs> I try to do longer, <laughs> Yes, um, for choreographers, for directors, uh, this time I think it uh, was a bit less hard than for dancers and for performers who are just executive uh, performers on stage. I mean, we still have something to do. Creation life could continue our creation life, uh, and in a way, it has got even more resources than uh, before. It's resources on I mean, time, energy, attention, uh, but with the inspiration, maybe sometimes there uh, were the problems in this time, but still, we uh, have time, it was productive time for developing all ideas or creating something. 
regardless to artists, uh, performers, the work on stage, uh, the job is stopped completely. Uh, even the rehearsals will be forbidden. So for sure, we live in real world and everybody will to eat, has to pay their bills, has to pay rent. And uh, some of my friends, artists, they all have to work as deliverers or drivers, which is terrible. Because uh, in the situations like that, you have to rehabilitate and work just to survive. The artists lose their nature, lose their themselves. So set to see. And now we've about some of this time some ideas of the work this time. Uh, I have one collaborative project with an artist who's from completely um, Olga, I'm sorry. I, I think uh, the hiss is just getting a little louder. Uh, I'm sh I'm not sure if the others can also hear you very clearly, because yeah. I I seem to be missing words in what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have a collaborative project uh, with one artist from completely different work with completely different background. Uh, and. I won't say the details for now because it is an innovative idea and we still develop it together. Uh, but we wanted to combine, to mix our kinds of art in a common performance. And first we wanted to make a, an art movie based on that combination. Uh, he lives in another country. And uh, I supposed to travel there to meet him and to work together and to film right. this movie. Yeah, but we can't, can't get, get, we can't do it. So we decided for now to film separately. Okay. Rather, I do my piece and he does his piece, and then we try to combine them somehow. Uh, and we, we decided to, to make this. We do this movie, this art uh, film, uh, on distance. I still don't know if it will work good because uh, we want to combine two cultures and show their transformation and their union at right. the end as a result. But we will try and see. Maybe it is a solution for now. Right. Uh, and also in these times, I realized that people, public, uh, they really like to see behind the scenes videos I and mean, the poses. As a dancer and performer, I do a lot of photo shoots and the video that's filming, and I started to record and publish uh, the materials from backstage. And sometimes I get uh, less uh, feedback and reactions on my main videos and photos, and right. more uh, feedback uh, and comments uh, for the video like behind the scenes, work in progress, uh, backstage uh, process or so. And this is nice because uh, viewers, they want to be closer, closer to the process uh, of art creation, uh, want to understand how it works. And uh, so they want to, to see uh, and, and they can see that it is also the hard job creating. I see that the mission of art is to inspire people and to give them impressions and to move them, to make their lives uh, more fulfilling. Sure, if we talk about dance and the theater, it is more strong impact uh, when a spectator can see the performer, the performer can hear, can feel this live energy can uh, immerse the atmosphere on stage. But if an artist cannot have this dialogue in life with the spectator, the big part of uh, the work of the performer is lost. 
Absolutely. Yeah. In the screen, the video, they can translate even a half of what we get watching the show live. Uh, but those are the circumstances which we all adopt in this situation. And online events uh, are the temporary solution. Uh, and this is the lesson that we can absorb from uh, the situation that anything can happen. And you must be prepared. Uh, and we cannot foresee what the day, the day, the next day will bring, but uh, we have to be open to transform, transform our professional activity in the new conditions. And uh, learn to find to see the new possibilities in every situation. Uh, but still, art disciplines such as uh, theater and dance, they have to be like, uh, they share, should continue with live performances. Maybe restrictions of quantity of uh, spectators, maybe outdoor out events, maybe some other solution. It is a very big question to politicians or uh, administrative people, uh, but it has to be like um, we passed through time when uh, everything was closed and cancelled uh, at all at the cultural places and events, uh, the last which coming back. Uh, it's still not in full uh, capacity here in Russia, in different countries, and in some countries it is forbidden at all still. Uh, and all that make people uh, think that culture is uh, not the necessary thing. Uh, like food, for example, because uh, cafes and restaurants, they, were, they have been opened and came back to their normal work. But it's not right. Uh, in contemporary world, in uh, these countries, where thanks God we don't have a war, culture such as the necessary part of life for for people as any basic needs. And people, I mean, uh, public visitors of theaters, uh, museums, they feel it uh, now. They miss uh, social life or uh, communication impressions, which they get uh, by visiting cultural events. And, uh, the live events are more important today than almost everybody spent half of their lives in winter. Otherwise, we are separated if we don't have live events at all. And especially in difficult times, uh, people need something to make their life, their days brighter. And that, what is art, is born for. We just have to be strong. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think um, even like what you said about, um, you know, I think we're just uh, looking at the possibilities that are present to us right now and finding new ones. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, all of us are deprived of the joy and the energy of having live performances. Um, but uh, thank you for bringing up um, uh, these points of uh, yeah um you know just uh, probably uh taking advantage of collaborative possibilities and um you know like you said maybe finding something um in the form of virtual performances so we'll get back to that uh, in the dialogue that we have after everyone gets done um is there uh, anything else that you'd like to say olga or uh, can i move on to the next guest Okay, thank you. Thank you. So our next guest is uh, Dr. Urmimala Sharkar Munchi. Um, she has been an associate professor of theater and performance studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics. Her specialization is in dance studies, visual anthropology, and ethnographic research. She is a dancer, choreographer trained at uh, the Uday Shankar India Cultural Center. Her current work is on changing landscapes of dance in India, 
sex trafficking and the designing of survival processes for survivors of trafficking and the politics of performance. She's also a visiting faculty at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, where she teaches a module on dance movement therapy. Uh, Dr. Sarkar is currently uh, the president of the World Dance Alliance uh, Asia Pacific and one of the directors of the board of Kolkata Sambhav, uh, an organization that works with women survivors of violence. She is the founder editor of the peer reviewed open access online journal of emerging dance scholarship and is uh, in the editor editorial board of the journal of Indian Anthropological Society. Uh, Dr. Sarkar, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me and giving this space to practitioners and dance the people from the dance world to come together. Um, you know, as I was thinking, as, as um, Sanmukta and Olga were speaking, I was thinking that I have three me's going on. I mean, I discovered that all the time I have three me's in me. And now it is even more clear. An individual dancer, choreographer, of course, but also this teacher who's, who's, who's kind of tried all her life to perfect the art of communicating to the next generation, the excitement of the world of dance, you know? And the third one is this writer who is writing as if her, write, as her life depends on writing. <laughs> it's almost like that, you know, in absence of other activities, you write. So the, and in short, if you ask me, there are three, there are a few things, they take away. like, I love what uh, Sanyukta was saying about, you know, how we need to introspect and we need to expand our world. I feel that, you know, uh, there's a kind of need in me to create consciousness of pluralism that many of us exist, many types exist. Everything is about differences coming together. The other one is the understanding of our privileges as urban dancers. We are really privileged. There are many who really want to dance, but they don't know how to privilege it or prioritize it at this time. And the other one is this whole sense of social exclusion, which is staring at us from all sides. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And so, uh, yeah, sorry, please go on. Um, so if you want me to elaborate a bit on some of the things, then I could, if you would like to, or do you have any question to ask? Absolutely, ma'am. Uh, we would love to know, um, like you can continue that uh, train of thought as well. And uh, also if you could briefly uh, tell us um, what your year has been uh, on an individual level, like and also in terms of work and as an artist, if you would like to elaborate on that as well, uh, okay. then that would be wonderful. So thank you. So after, just after the lockdown, I spent about 20 days staring at the ceiling in different manners. I mean, lying down, staring up, you know, and then, I mean, totally unmanaged kind of schedule, going haywire everywhere. And I was locked down away from my university campus in Calcutta in my home. Right. Then I started dancing. Every evening from four to six, I was dancing on the terrace. And I didn't care that people were seeing and thinking that, you know, this old lady is dancing away to glory and, you know, how stupid I was looking. Or maybe they were thinking that I was mad. I couldn't care less. But, you know, it saved really. It actually, I was, I, I was missing ensemble. I was missing classes. I was missing our workshops, holding hands, and and this was the only way I was, I could, could kind of be a part of that past world. And you know, it's something that I read actually gave me the sense of direction uh, in that whole phase that I tried to discipline myself. Um, and I thought that, you know, uh, one remembers Antonio Gramsci's words. 
pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And, you know, I suddenly thought that, um, you know, he wrote this in his prison notebooks and COVID-19 for me holds us all literally in our safe spaces. We are constantly trying to create something safe. Prisoners of our own concerns for others and selves. This pandemic has restricted and realigned our thoughts, movements, and our communicative processes in more ways than one. Lack of freedom to gather as a community to move dance together, use dance studios, severe lack of patronage in the troubled times, and complete restriction on any possibilities of performing for a live audience seemed like both the previous speaker said, like a death knell for dance and dancers for a while. But the relentless optimism of the will has prevented us from becoming discouraged. And most dancers have found their own words in all this. It, opened, it has opened for us sometimes or closed down doors sometimes in small, limited, but powerfully enabling windows uh, of communication, dancers have managed to change their modes, mediums, and methods of moving, teaching, choreographing, and being visible. Pessimism of the intellect may be debilitating at times, but it has not been able to kill the optimism of the will. But this experience of being locked down and thus also being locked out of dance spaces, which for some mean partial or complete occupational lockdown automatically, has energized my thoughts um, that begin by registering a deep anxiety about the fact that this sense of disquiet and utter hopelessness about the future of dance now, a popular lament in COVID-19 times has been heard may, for many years now and is a commonly heard lament within the lesser known, lesser popular community dance halls, which we have never heeded. The fear and lament has increased over the years with the increase in the decrease in the patronage in community practices. Lack of occupational possibilities has squeezed life out of many traditional art forms. Not surprisingly, as people have moved away from their niche community environments, either physically to other geographies or because of the fast changing experience, experiential and occupational environment. Taking reception and patronage as the lifeblood or oxygen for any category of dance to exist in the current times I then search for ways to create a pluralistic and empathetic space that includes all voices across class, caste, and gender, in spite of the hegemonic and hierarchic dominance and presence of certain dance forms over others. In bringing together focus on dance as a source of power, knowledge production, economic and socio-political support, as well as Severe dispossession. I'm energized by recent lines in Susan Foster's book, Value in Dance. An oddly simple yet seldom remarked, and she, this is quoting from her, uh, an oddly simple yet seldom remarked upon aspect of dancing is that it brings people's bodies, people as embodied, people as bodily presences into proximity. They physically co-mingle, they collaborate, dominate, or exist, or even pretend to get involved, but they connect through and in the action of dancing. In this juncture, I know we are really bothered about survival and with legitimate reasons. But if at all we can spare some time, I think it would do the world of dance for the coming generations a great service if we manage to relocate and re-energize discourses on inevitabilities, such as large-scale urbanization, post-independence cultural policies of India, 
changing definitions of viability and market evaluation of the arts in general and dance in particular. That said, let us conclude by asking ourselves, Residing mostly in urban privileged spaces, how does one address an absent audience? How does one navigate the restrictions that availability of resources, restricted physical space and impossibility of collaborations with accomplices or a community put on us? Thus, those of us who have grown up enjoying and feeling empowered, not by dancing alone, but by the power of ensemble practice and excitement of group choreography and workshops, feel deeply frust frustrated at having to move alone, if at all. I hope we either really adjust to the new real soon and find ways of defying this ongoing crisis. Remaining positive in attitude is dependent now on COVID tests coming negative. Life and dancing sure need some change now. Empathy is the word that becomes the survival kit, not aggression and competition. I agree totally with Samyuta when she said this. In these troubled times filled with bereavements, ill health and fear, I hope we shall go on dancing, researching dance and celebrating the spirit of togetherness. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, the optimism of the will, so beautifully put. I think uh, that, and like you said, the spirit of togetherness and the hope of getting that back again, probably in the physical space. I think that is what we are kind of holding on to right now and um, taking each day as it, as it comes. And uh, also thank you for bringing um, up the point of also privilege. Uh, the privilege to even have these kind of discussions um, is, is a really uh, big thing and uh, something that is not accessible to a lot of people. So uh, thank you. Um, I will, again, I have taken note of all of uh, your points and also what has been discussed earlier and we will come back to that at the end of the discussion. So um, I will now move on to our fourth guest for today, um, Martin Pilipanski. Martin has joined us from Argentina today. He is an architect, dancer and teacher of improvisation. He has studied independently between USA, Europe and Argentina. Um, he is currently based in Buenos Aires. Um, and we have been looking at his wonderful uh, um, a backdrop where the sun has been rising for the past hour. In the last decade, uh, he has toured to South America, North and Center, and a large part of Europe and Africa and Asia, where he has taught improvisation and dancing in various festivals and international stages. Um, he has received the Dance Atelier and Dance Web Scholarships in Austria. Uh, he currently is collaborating artistically with the English teacher and dancer Kirsty Simpson and the North American dancer Elia Mark. He has created his own works between solitaires and group works. Um, blending his background in architectures and dance, Martin teaches teaching how the possibilities of spaces in which we live can transform dance and life itself. Um, he is sustained by a practice in deep listening to oneself and the environment that con contains us. And he shares his practice through teaching and performance to students and uh, to students and audiences all over the world. Martin, a very good morning to you and a hearty welcome uh, here at our session today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, what a moment, what a moment we are passing through. Absolutely. I always say that for me, Love was always love in all the times, and violence was violence in all the times too. Um, not so long, I recognized my own violence in my body. And especially through dance, I appreciate dance because dance really teach something that you cannot explain. Language is sometimes uh, I have my friend Ilya always say, language is the worst way of communication. 
So I really believe in dance, especially in this moment. Um, when everything shut down, I was in the airport. I was taking a flight to Hong Kong to a dream work. Like finally I have a contract and I have money to paint my house. Um, but no way. The world say, no, you stop. So I have my bag and I say what I do because I close the windows of my house. I sell my mattress, actually no mattress at home. So I decide to move, well, to move, to take a flight to the north, what is my family? I, actually now I'm here in the north, in a new place. <laughs> so I don't know what has changed in this last year, but uh, I'm a man who tried to be, to get softer in life, to, to be more awake. Um, for that reason, I love dance, for one reason, it's hard to explain what my body really was feeling through this shut it down. Um, my very good friend, Kirsty Simpson, always said that violence stay in the, in the matter, in la materia. And we can work a lot in the head, we can work a lot in ideas about, but freedom, violence, and love is here. So it's my only big concern. Dance will never change. Dance will be always dance because it's a manifestation of love, happiness, and all the things. Maybe the format, how we do, maybe it's through internet, maybe it's, I don't know. For me, the first eight weeks was to shut down. <laughs> really, I went to the mountain. Thank God I was in India before and I, 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 I did my vipassana and my things. So I really say, okay. And because I'm Jewish, my, my friends say, well, you are like a monk and Jewish and, and we are human. So I, I shut down my, my stuff, my application, everything. And I say, okay, quietness. That's a very strong part of that stillness. I believe a person who can listen their own thinking, what you think is a way to be free. Uh, so all the monsters, they went down to the earth. <laughs> so I shake a lot. Um, I jump. I was very lucky I have a, I don't know how to say a, a trampoline bed. So I was jumping. Um, and yeah, that happened in the first eight weeks and then I decided to move back to Buenos Aires. I was living with my parents and that was too much for the first time in 20 years. <laughs> And I say, okay, it's a moment to be quiet. I, I, don't, I will not push, I will not teach through Zoom. I don't like Zoom. I don't like this connection. Uh, I'm so sorry. So I'm working in university and so the university was, please, please teach it. Yeah. So then I decide, I, I, I accept, but really, no, it's not my way. <laughs> I say, okay, it's a moment to do something different, to, to, to really accept reality. Um, you know, one month ago, I was a jury of the ballet, the contemporary ballet here in, in this town. And I, I, I taught the class, uh, the warming up for the student. And in the end of the warming up, that many students, they come, we have the chance to do in presence. And, I asked to them why they dance. And you know, in, I have eight groups because of the protocol of the way we need to do it right now. Uh, in each group, one person say, I dance because I want to run away from reality. And I say, no, that's the reality that artists, we need to bring what we feel. Like, I think, Mala, I don't know if I pronounce okay your name, she says something about we are so privileged because we have the, the, the really the possibility to feel. Um, to, I think that's the power of dancing. Dancing is about the present. When you turn around your axis, you are in the present moment. And, and that's the reality. That's the reality that the dancer is passing through. So right now my reality is like, I'm here. I wake up this morning at five in the morning to have this conversation with you. 
I know it's a pandemic going on around. Uh, I'm not trying to avoid that. But what I will really decide in this moment was what kind of food I will check, what kind of information I will listen, what kind of music, with who I will expose my, my soul, my life. And the difference about this pandemic or other very big crisis in the world is like the people who is awake in this moment is taking this like a, not like a chance to change because change will happen anyway, is to see where I am. And it's not about to know where you are. It's not about, it's not about knowledge. <laughs> It's, it's not about to, to know what to do or how to transform what we do. I don't care about that. I don't care about how I transform my dance. My dance will be always on me, always on me. The thing is really how, how I, I, I can be humble, uh, humble with myself, there start. And, and that's the tricky thing right now. Many people come to me and say, wow, Martin, you are so lucky. Now you can meditate more. You can read more, you can write more and say, no, 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 I was doing that before this. Why this is changing to, why? It's like people, we supposed to create projects to, to do things for the future. And who cares about the future? <laughs> you don't know what will happen. That's the beauty of dance. You are living present. And, and it's not uh, something metaphoric. It's not about, it's not poetry. I love poetry, but this is true. That's reality. And that's the reality that dance and an artist we can bring right now. I don't know how, believe me, I was not trying to develop nothing new in this moment. No idea. I don't have desire to write. I don't have so much desire to dance. I don't have so much desire to. The only thing I really did is running, <laughs> I was running, maybe because I'm 40 and uh, I'm Jewish and the, the, the old Jewish uh, Kabbalah explained that the passion in men, but it's different in women, no? Women is all life, in men, no, <laughs> it's less. Uh, so something happened in our passion that I was running from here. And believe me, I was dancing through running and yeah. Another thing that happened, I adopt a dog. <laughs> I adopt a beautiful Galgo. Um, and that was my year. Um, last thing I started to, to do is to, to write, it was a weird thing, but the university invited me to do a PhD about my practice, to write about that. And I think, okay, this is the way. So. Three, four, more, four months every day I was meditating, writing and doing this, running and jumping in the bed. And, and then I said, no, <laughs> I'm not this. <laughs> I mean, I will write for myself. I love university. I have my studios and my things. But the information right now is so overwhelming. It's so much information. So everything is about the image. And I say, no, no, no. If I will be lost, let's go first. Let's get lost. And I think I drop it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think so far was my life in the last year. Um, yeah, I was teaching through Zoom, some classes in university, but I think I'm living right now. Um, I'm working more like an architect. <laughs> I never thought like after 20 years practicing movement and dance, I will come back to some profession that I love but of course I prefer to be an artist, but no money is a terrible situation. That's reality and I think it's good. And I'm getting supporting from my family. So I think I'm using the abundance what is in my life. In one side is all this that I'm telling to you. In the other side, I know I'm a happy person. I have happiness in my heart. So it's what I need to do is to share that. Last thing. In, in, in Kavala, people say that the dancer is somebody who have happiness in your heart so you can move your hands and your feet. And I think that's a beautiful image about what is a dancer. No shape, unshape, like love, 
like energy. You don't know, like future, you don't know. And, and that's, that's abundance. That's what we have like human beings. Um, yeah, something like that. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, thank you for also focusing on, I mean, as your personal experience on just being present without trying to do anything outside of it. Um, you know, so uh, thank you so much. Um, I now uh, open the session to um, all of you uh, in case you have anything to express about what the others have shared. And we, I'm going to also take a look at the questions that are uh, coming in, if we have any. And I have a few for you. So uh, yes, just give me one moment, please. Um, so I have um, a question. I'm going to start with that. Um, I attended a workshop uh, during the pandemic and um, the focus was in moving in the space that was present to us. Um, but uh, the constant prompt was to visualize the space between, beyond the four walls. Um, in which I was present, uh, which I thought was also important because I think uh, personally, I also started, uh, you know, I uh, there is a tendency to just limit yourself to the physical space then and it becomes difficult to visualize the world that is outside. So also on a performative level, but um, also on an individual level, uh, uh, my question is how do you visualize like in terms of like your personal practice um, how do you visualize creating something bigger? I'm not saying uh, that particularly in terms of a proscenium space, but just in terms of how do I visualize the sky when I'm not looking at it or when there is no opportunity to look at it uh, maybe on, on um, a frequent basis? How do I visualize, um, you know, um, a, a, an expanded space that is not limited to my uh, apartment how, how uh, could you please share something about that you just told about that everything uh, goes from inside so you have to find this space this wide uh, space inside and transform it outside and uh, Yes, and if we talk about the reality, then the, I, I don't know about the situation in, the, in other countries, but uh, here in Russia, we can go to the dead space now and to wider space, uh, more bigger than our flat, our room. This is a happiness. And the first day when we uh, were permitted to do that, it was really like a New Year kind. Right. Uh, uh, but when we were locked down in uh, the small room, it was the really everyday task to remember, to look out of the window, to remember that uh, there is something bigger than your room, than your own space. And I think it is not the question only for dancers and for anybody, uh, because this is the quality of our character, of our humanity, that uh, sometimes we close down ourselves in small space, we start to uh, think about problems to, I don't know, to, to depress ourselves or so, or maybe in a good mood, but still in some very small ball inside, we are in a bubble there, but we have to uh, remember all the time that uh, the world is big and uh, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ermi Mala ma'am, uh, you touched upon the topic of um, privilege and uh, whenever there is a discussion about privilege, uh, it brings in the politics of dance or the politics of just uh, any element that we uh, exist in as part of society. Um, uh, my question uh, was in terms of, um, you know, in the past year we've seen a lot of a room where suddenly everyone was sharing 
their own uh, performances that they recorded in the space of you know wherever they were and um there were i, I sensed a sort of hierarchy where uh, the like a lot of people who come from a uh, bigger cities um there was uh, you know the sort of a judgment that was passed upon um people who were you know sharing a lot of videos on tiktok from like rural villages so i just uh, wanted to ask you about you know how aesthetics comes into um the into this sort of a circumstance and how a certain group of people finds it right or how it suddenly becomes okay to judge or something that other people are sharing so that sort of a you know could you could you touch upon that a little bit please so one thing dance training does is to make you a dancer and therefore it also introduces a certain kind of do and don't do in the bodies in the thought processes mm-hmm. so many of us all of us might agree on this that when we see somebody dancing somebody else dancing we get into this automatic mode it's very hard to stop ourselves from judging and you have to actually very very keenly very very intentionally stop yourself and you have to learn to stop judging right so that unlearning of what we know as right is something that is a individual thing but in our whole cultural sphere we have, are introduced us in, into a socializational system where we are socialized into thinking that it is our right to think what we know as correct and it is always introduced especially in india some dances are more dance than others hmm. some dances are not dances they are cultural practices or oh, they do rituals they move but that those are repetitive those are not dances we have to do it in a certain manner we have to mm-hmm. have that so those kinds of those kinds of spaces those kind of privileges of separating dance world for us only for practice only for this meditative space where i can practice being better and better in the grammar that i have been taught is not part of our community practices all around but that's that's where we are at the moment it's an unfortunate thing because if we open our eyes and look at the communities who are all around us many of us have been part of those communities we don't we haven't come from the sky right absolutely we yes just moved into other societal spaces right so the, that that awareness is something that we we should have had already and it's not it's not given so indian dance if you tell anybody it's not their fault that they would talk about only bollywood and bharatnatyam and kathak probably and some odissi and all the other dances are never known yeah so that hierarchization we have introduced and we have not helped the situation so that's why this hierarchy of course has stopped here i can go on <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely yeah because i i just thought that even um uh, like you mentioned cultural um or classical dancing so like uh, here uh, what i also uh, sort of meant was i mean for me to be coming from a city and to be just sharing my movement practice but just because i have probably um a string of fairy lights and uh, just because i'm wearing something it it looks cooler but when there is probably a farm at the back and there are two people who are wearing more traditional clothes um it's just automatically assume that that's going to be funny and that will go viral as a funny story where but both videos will probably have an equal level of um, i i don't even know like uh, you know uh, sharing or skills or whatever attached to it uh, so just that uh, right is also sort of infuriating because suddenly as a group we are already uh, deciding that okay what um, a certain group of people are doing is um, absolutely acceptable because it looks and um, is more um, i don't know um consumable as as part of social media so um but yeah thank you for uh, touching upon that um 
in case anyone uh, for people watching in case you have any questions you can also type them in the chat box i i would like to add to that uh, point yes yes because i think um, when we watch videos you know the one way of people remaining sane is putting themselves out there on social media that's their way of Absolutely. being with the world so we have no right to tell anyone what to post or what not to post and one of the videos which i have really enjoyed probably one of my best performances of the year this year has been the rasputin video of those two doctors in yeah. Canada, in which they did that <laughs> duet in their medical uh, yes in which they were really hitting it i i felt just so much joy and so much freedom watching that you know and so i think these are bubbles of happiness and some bubbles of happiness will reach five people and some will reach 5 million and let it you know, we have no right to judge what needs to go on or what doesn't need to go on and what the, the word aesthetics i think itself we need to rethink and also to, for, to respond to your earlier question about imagining this space and you know when you just hold a mudra mm-hmm. for instance you know i think the world of dance gives you so much in terms of this is happening in the now right this is the present for me this is my finger folding on to my thumb but this is also a mudra that has been held by millions of dancers before and they have worked on it and they have put their breath in it in the history of kathak there have been so many people who have held this mudra so it's historical it is psycho- psychological because what i'm feeling is uh, you know moving into this mudra and then it, and it moves and it opens the whole space opens with it and the whole space that i'm inhabiting can just suddenly take on like this idea of something that's beyond time so it's not you're not in the here you're in history you belong to a past and you're also in the present and you're taking it into the future so this idea of dance just breaking notions of physical time time as we know it and space as we know it is something that really i think needs to spread in some way like a tal is not a rhythm is not just a cycle of beats tirkit dha is not just like a conglomeration of sounds it is uh, energy forms and those can be felt here they can be felt in the spine they can release something and that's the power i think that dance has which you we need to and you know it'll have different forms like olga will have totally different energy space that she passes on to me and i'll pass it on to umimala and she'll pass it on to martin and you know it, it's a it's a universal wordless like martin said language which we really need to use to empower ourselves and others right. around us right and i think like you mentioned previously also giving your body the opportunity to lead a particular um cognitive state or like a mental state so i think that can also be very powerful where you're trying to prob- like in times where you're probably trying to uh, make sense of everything cognitively to allowing uh, shifting that space into giving your body uh, the option and the space to uh, create another uh, state of mind there's also something that can be very uh, beautiful and something very beautiful can come out of that also so yes and i have something small because all what you say was all the time in my mind like like i, I don't know sanhukta your name I, i know how to pronounce i'm sorry uh, but it was so beautiful to think one of the most strong things that i learn i would say practice actually you never learn is to accept the unknown and dance have that power and it's a moment that i think the the biggest Bible, violence right now is we are fighting to something about that we don't know. We don't know about this virus. We don't understand how we can get it and how we can confront in a way. So that is so important to keep alive in our practice because that make a big difference about dance and other kind of performing arts. Uh, because you, you, you empower feeling 
the perception of that, the perception to unknown, and you just move like you did with the mudra. It's so beautiful. It's like open, open, and open my whole body, you know, and in, in my body, my mind, and then everything that was traveling through me. So that's the, 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 the way to empower the energy. So I don't know what will happen with the practice. I consider myself like an artist, but not all dancers are artists. And, you know, like, I don't know how we transform what I do, but I do believe that I try to keep myself in the idea of respect this, this unknown path about whatever I do, I would with a conscious that I don't know, <laughs> that I don't know. And that's a way to empower my context in any place in the world. So if you are awake and you are with this conscious that I appreciate through dance, and now if I need to change it, I don't, I don't care, but I'm conscious about that. The unknown is something I can't control, especially in the dance practice. See so much violence inside, inside of teaching, of the pedagogy, of what we do, right or led, female or male. It's like, what? What are we talking about? Like, come on, we need to, to really transform that, to, to, to work together in the sense of we don't know. And that's the difference right now. Like, is the moment that we know about everything, like never, never we have so much information, so much possibility to connect. Look, we are connected in India, in the north of Argentina, in Russia, in, I don't know, but we, are, we don't feel better. <laughs> we don't create a better life. I'm sorry if I'm too, but what we can do is being conscious about that we don't know. <laughs> Holding life is not a way to empower the context. Accepting reality is accept our own violence, our own capacity of, I don't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Martin. Um, speaking of uh, violence, um, I will move on to the next question uh, from Prasad. In, in the current scenario, when artists are completely sidelined, marginalized and not remembered. Do you think dance can actually help to heal? Um, there is, I mean, as a society, we don't think of artists as important contributors to our living. We say so, but we don't believe it. How would an artist, a dancer, deal with this? I, I'm sorry, but continue talking, but last week I had a chance to perform my piece. And that was a piece I was traveling through different continents and was very, and here is a very small community, but it's, it's a community. I was making choreography for the company and things. And you know, I perform and nobody of that dancer, they come to my perform. I'm not like peace, but it's, it's a little about reality. Because sometimes the context, we think, we, we complain about what is not there, what we need, what is missing. I'm so tired of that. And maybe you can say, wow, you are talking through your privilege because maybe you don't need to eat five classes in a day to have food. But well, I can speak from this place and I'm saying that if your heart, if your mind is poor, in relation of going up, expanding the energy, expanding the abundance that we have in life every day, we, are, we don't have any change, any chance to move. And I'm saying this because, especially in my country, it's very poor. I mean, in relation of uh, resources for dancers, all the dancers, they work without money. I, I teach in the university, like maybe two euros for the class, even if I have 50 students, of course I do because I love, but now is the moment to say, no, I'm not teaching for that money. Of course I'm not teaching for the money, but I mean, if I don't stop that violence, it's because I accept that. And sometimes the context, especially in the, in the artist, I'm sorry if I'm too political in that because I don't have any political direction. I'm very political in my work, in my body, in what I say, and I'm saying this, this kind of poor way 
to approach what we do come from us. Of course, we can talk about the politicians and all the situation, but look the world right now. Dance is the very, very, very last thing because such a fragile thing. This house, I mean, dance doesn't have a house, dance doesn't have a theater. The house of dance is our body, our conscious. So we are very privileged in one sense, and the other, very, very, very poor in other. So we need to check it out that, check it out that, because I'm a little tired about, we don't have money, na na na, na na. Our resource is, yeah, sorry. Thank you for that, because yeah, I wanted to say that people have a perception that dance is performance. Dance is not performance. You know, performance has stopped and it should stop. I really believe this is performance should stop. The show must not go on. People are saying the show must go on. The art must live on. This glorious art with like, stop it. No, it doesn't need to go on. People are dying out there. We need to hold space for the real performers today who are the frontline workers. We have to hold space for them and not stop dancing. Dance is in the breath. Dance is in connecting to your neighbor, in connecting to your friend, in making that phone call, in having this conversation. All of this is also dance. It's a, like Umi Mala said, you know, bring communities together. You know, we must forget that dance is not about professional dance, performing and limit the identity of dance to just that. That's what was happening and that is very violent and that's horrible and that needs to go. We need to bring the, an idea of dance that connects back. I think Purvi um, Malam wanted to yeah. say something. Um, uh, thank you for bringing it to something that I wanted to say and I cut it out because it would be too long. Um, I was trying to use two words. One is uh, participation and one is presentation. And great that both of you brought that up. Uh, so I was thinking that there are people in this world who also dance, but who do it for themselves. It's a kind of inward looking journey, right? They hold hands, they do a circular pattern, they hold hands, they hold energy, they hold each other, they hold the community, they believe in each other through their moving. And that moving doesn't have to be a showpiece. It doesn't have to show anybody that I am a better dancer. If you ask them who is a better dancer, they'll laugh at you actually. They'll say that, you know, every one of us learns dancing while being tied to our mother's back. So there's nothing like specialized better dancer than others. Whereas there is another category, which is the presentational form, which is learned expertise. It's a box full of skills. It Sometimes it actually makes you lose the connection between the heart and the work that you do. And this, this whole disconnect is violent, actually. Because dance is otherwise something that a child breaks out into when she's or he's happy, right? So this, this abnormalcy of becoming something, of showing the world, of, you know, it is something that has gone on for a long time. And it's this time is something that has made us understand. And we see a lot of that, that need to be visible, need to present on the net all the time. And therefore, the internet has actually provided a certain kind of relief to that, that wish to be seen. And I think the inner time, which is so horribly mentally kind of, you know, it's sitting on people, it's creating horrible mental, you know, mental shocks and traumas and anxieties. Of course, any form that you can dance in, if you want to, for yourself within your room, but it doesn't need to be a presentation. If we can reduce that anxiety of being 
doing a presentation for the world, maybe our dance would give us some time and with ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah, I think just exploring the idea of dancing or any other arts practice for ourselves instead of making it, like you said, presenting it to the world or um, uh, expecting a certain feedback. But of from course, it. I would actually apologize because I'm taking for granted that people have something to live on. You know, I think some people need to earn through their dances and we must not disrespect that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing that. And uh, to Martin and Sanjukta also for sharing their thoughts. Olga, would you like to add something to this? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, so many things already. I think I can add only that dance uh, really can heal if we talk about that. Uh, any of our situations, every situation which we are dropped in, in reality, we can uh, feel and transform and uh, heal ourselves through dance. Because dance, as, as uh, the previous uh, speaker said, dance is not just about showing something and it is not dancing, not performance. Dancing is not about showing, not about being better than others or, I don't know, so how beautiful is the dancer or so, not only. But it is uh, the stream of energy and it, it can be, if you don't talk about the performance, but talking about dancing in general, everybody can dance, everybody. Uh, and. Uh, movement can really heal. I think it's, it, it's not a new, uh, so many systems of uh, movement healing, of movement uh, uh, therapy are invented already. Uh, and yeah, we are lucky because we have this resource and we uh, build it with our skin. Yes, Martin. <laughs> Our skin is full of this energy and we are translating it to the world. I'm very happy to hear all these uh, things with which we are discussed today because it is really uh, helpful. Uh, I think it will, it will be very helpful for people who will uh, watch this conference afterwards. Uh, not, I just want to tell that not everybody are so strong and positive uh, like our speakers today. Uh, I really uh, will see many, many cases of de depression through artists and uh, people of art uh, like uh, directors, uh, painters, uh, musicians through this time. And, um, I want to thank everybody for this positive mood and all that you want to bring and your words and thank you. Absolutely. Um, the intention was uh, exactly this. Uh, we're all uh, dealing with it in our own individual capacities and um, the idea for this session was uh, that we could, uh, you know, gain some strength from each other and uh, maybe go back with a few new thoughts and you know, uh, use them as uh, we think is right in our situation. Uh, so thank you, all of you. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I think this is a good place to kind of, you know, uh, come to the end. Um, any parting thoughts from any of you? Okay, I think everyone is in a very reflective uh, mood. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, Aditi, would you like to say? Yes, I just want to come in and quickly thank all of you for sharing these uh, insights. It's really a lot to reflect on. And uh, like also Olga mentioned, maybe we can go back to this conversation even after it's over. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's an engineer and, you know, time and again, we 
go back to this thought for the last whole year it's not just the artists but every single person has been struggling uh, irrespective of what background what you know what profession and everything but sometimes it's just i i personally feel it's it's good we have the arts to heal at least we have our, our own art to give us that little hope when we you know if not i can just go on my mat or just like like urmimala mam was saying just stare at the ceiling or just go on the terrace and just dance but thank you guys thank you olga martin for joining us all the way from russia and argentina thank you urmimala mam i hope the situation in delhi uh gets better sanjukta sending you lots of love mumbai and pune look like they are slightly you know looking at better numbers and i'm just sending everyone a lot of best wishes good health love um we are going to sign off from facebook so everybody who's joined us on facebook thank you everybody who's joined us on zoom many many thanks and we shall come back to another session just in a couple of minutes so thank you guys goodbye i just and also bye. wanted to say a big shout out to ipar for organizing this. absolutely because i um, i think the way forward is reimagining dance culture reimagining performing arts community spaces yes it begins with conversations like this so you know i hope we can collectively democratically re <laughs> realize our culture to have healthier more inclusive uh, performing arts culture so thank you so much for this thank you a pleasure complete to you all of these so really wonderful thoughts of empathy diversification less violence more internalization let's just stick to that and on that note goodbye everyone and have a wonderful time ahead bye 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 bye